Linux Out Loud is firing up our microphones, connecting those headphones as we search the community for themes to expand upon. We keep the banner friendly of the conversation somewhat on topic and have fun doing it. This week, we are spouting off about unconventional paths to careers. Let's get into episode 61. Linux Out Loud is brought to you by Linode and Bitwarden. And with me today are my fine co-host, Nate and Wendy. Wendy, you are finally back from all the robotics things. And Nate, well, you'll just sound robotic because you have that unhealthy obsession with OpenSUSE. That's what I guess. <laughs> Why, what do you mean, Matt? Matt? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes, I am back and... The whole, what was it, like eight months of robotics and then the stress leading up to it and the time there is kind of caught up with me, as you can tell by listening. I am sick, but I am here with all of you because you need an update. I did tease it on my Mastodon, and so it wouldn't be fair if I skipped another week, even though I am struggling to talk. So I do apologize for my lack of voice. But you guys are getting your updates. There were quite a few of our kids who had never flown before, and so it was super fun, including me. So just getting through those initial flights was a ton of fun. We all got through it like champs. There was no issues in TSA. But we flew out on a Monday. Tuesday was a fun day. So we got to go hit the Galveston Beach for the first time, and that was an absolute blast. It was a really windy day which was a downside, but the kids had a ton of fun on the waves. We headed back to the convention center and got the Tesla coil pit set up. We even got our badges printed for the building beasts, so we wouldn't have to worry about that the following day, just had it taken care of. Then on Wednesday, that was the day that the building beasts got to set up our pits, and we stowed all of our stuff in the Tesla coils pit so it didn't have to be reloaded, which saved us a bunch of time getting all of that set up. We got to show up a little bit later, got everything put together, and got to start touring what other countries were around us. It was really cool. So we were in pit 50, and then to the left of us, was Japan. To the right of us was Australia and Kitty Corner to the right was Malaysia. So cool. That is super cool. Yeah, to get to interact with these other countries, not like because there was a bunch more still there, but then having these other countries really close and getting to talk to them on a regular basis. The Japan team, it was pretty awesome. So if you went over to their booth, they would write your name in Japanese for you, which was pretty awesome. And then the Malaysian team across for us, they had some different cookies and stuff that were from their country. And the dresses that the ladies wore were absolutely gorgeous. I'm glad I don't have to wear a dress. Um, but they were, they were absolutely beautiful, really, really beautiful. So it was cool to get to interact with them for a few days Then on Thursday was the first real day of Worlds for us. We had our three practice runs, and none of our runs went quite as planned, and I'll go into more detail on that later during the host-related interest section. But after we got through our runs, and actually it was kind of weird the way they had it set up. So we had three runs, and they were all an hour apart, And they were exactly the same three runs we were going to get the next day. So that part was kind of nice, as in the schedule that we had for the Thursday was a lot like our schedule for the Friday. The biggest issue was there really wasn't a whole lot of time to go ahead and hit the practice tables after that, especially where the schedule was a little bit off on that first day, which is why you have a practice day. So that everything was on time on Friday, but by the time we actually got through our round on the practice day, it was actually time for us to be queuing again at the table. So that was a little bit hurried. And then when we got through our practice runs, it was time to let the kids have a little bit of fun. And of course, 
they wanted to tease what next year's theme was. And in order to do this, they had this gigantic Lego wall and I'm pretty sure they were screen printed. So you would get this little Lego square and there were colors on the tables. And so you'd match the colors on your square with the Lego colors on the table, hand it to the people across the wall and they would connect them. And so as these squares slowly got filled in, then it went from this year's theme, which was super powered, to next year's theme, which I'm super excited about, masterpiece and I can talk about more on that later. The kids got to go down to the innovation fair. We didn't get to spend as much time there as I would like but they had different businesses with some of their technology. We got to talk to NASA there about some of the projects that they have going on, projects that are getting ready to go to the moon to be tested out before they hit Mars It was incredible to get to see hands-on some of that stuff, talk to the people that are working on those things and putting them out there. Friday was all about competition. We got there really early because I wanted to get us scheduled on the practice table, did our three robot rounds. The kids had just enough time to go get some lunch, and then they had judging, which our judging started at three, and it was roughly... 45-ish minutes is what they could hold us. And our pits had to be completely down by 4.30. So thankfully, we have a another team that works with us. The Tesla Coils came and pretty much had their pit tore down by the time we were done with judging. And my favorite part, my absolute favorite part of the whole week was Saturday morning. And we were running late because I had messed with my alarm clock somehow and trying to set times for the practice table. We were only allowed 10 minutes over on the practice tables. So I was trying to make sure that we were using like eight of those minutes and leaving the last two minutes to make sure that we were being good, a good first Lego League team and having time to reset the table. So when the next team got there, they didn't have to reset. All they could do is just get to work with their robot. And I apparently accidentally turned my alarm clock off. We were supposed to be leaving our house at 7 a.m., And I was awoken at like 6.45. Yeah, just before we had to leave. (laughs) So it was a mad scramble. Thankfully, most of the kids were up, but my daughter wasn't up. We were having to share a room. The other gal that was helping um, kind of guide the team that week, we were all in the same bedroom, all still asleep because, you know, my alarm didn't go off. So mad rush, we get out the door, our robot, since we had to tear down our pits the following day, was in the Tesla coils pit. So someone went to go grab that. We ran for where we were supposed to gather and got there just in time to find the details of the Encore game. Now this is something that was just for fun. You got to sign up to participate if you wanted to. You didn't have to participate. And this was crazy. So... We were given an hour to build whatever we needed to build and write the code. They took pretty much every single mission off the mat and they put the energy cells that we had been collecting over the course of it on different places on those mats and they put up several walls and you could run two robots at the same time because you're actually working with another team. So you are working with an alliance partner to do this together. And you could go gather the units. You had to bring them back home. But then you couldn't just use your robot to drive them to home. No, you had to shoot them, fling them, flip them, whatever from home into the center position on the mat. So we were working with the team from Australia that was just to our right hand side. Awesome, awesome group of kids. And it was amazing to see them work together. And we ended up getting through all three rounds. So it wasn't just based on your score. It was also based on time. So that very first round, they didn't score anything, but they put up a really good showing. Our robot was a lot smaller and there was kind of a tighter spot at the back of the game board. 
So they coded our robot to go all the way around to gather the energy cells and take them to the Australian team. And then it was the Australian team's job to get them into the center of the map. So that first mechanism didn't work quite the way they wanted it to. But based on time, even though we didn't score any points, we made it into round two. They did some changes to the code on before round two. And when they went to round two, it froze up like the robot wouldn't run because we had an error. But they stopped the clock at 45 seconds. And because of that case, we got into round three, which was absolutely nice. amazing. We probably shouldn't have made it into round three, but they did. And the kids kept working on things even between those rounds. They didn't let the fact that they didn't score anything stop them. They fixed the error in the code, which the only error was they had put in a motor that they were no longer using. And so it aired out because it was trying to find that motor and it couldn't find it. So all they had to do was comment that out. Their code was just fine. And the Australian team made some changes to their robot too. And I got to figure out how they did this, but they basically had a turntable in their robot. And so they added this additional L-type arm to it and then program their robot to turn really fast on that turntable and flip the energy units into the center. So we actually scored some points on the very last round. The kids had a blast. I have some amazing pictures of that. Of course, we went to lunch, come down kind of from that, that fun high, and then it was time for the awards ceremony. The kids did absolutely awesome in judging. But there's 108 teams. There is some amazing teams there. And I wasn't actually anticipating us walking away with a trophy. But they did. They were able to win a Rising Star trophy, which is pretty awesome. And had some amazing experiences Sunday was kind of a quiet day. Well, it was supposed to be a quiet day. We went to NASA, and every other robotics team that was still in Texas decided they wanted to go to NASA. Well, of course. So it was way too full. It was, yeah, yeah, it was way too full. It was really hard to see anything. But the stuff we get, did get to see was fun. I did have an amazing hamburger at a local shop there, a little local hamburger shop there. I was hoping you are going to say you had an amazing hamburger at NASA that was like freeze-dried or something like that. <laughs> no, no, no hamburgers there. I did try <laughs> to get a coffee when we were at NASA. Is it freeze-dried too? No, their espresso <laughs> machine had issues and they didn't oh. have half and half. So I was stuck oh. with an Americano instead of a Breve. It's not a terrible thing, but I hope to go to NASA sometime again when there's fewer people. And then after that, we went and saw a movie as a team. All in all, really fun. Back to the beach on Monday. It was still super windy, but I actually did go play in the waves on Monday. And it was a ton of fun. Like, I really enjoyed it. You couldn't actually swim just because those waves are so big and they were coming so fast. But it was fun riding some of the waves on the boogie board and, and jumping through them. Then Monday, it was... Monday night was back home. We packed everything up because we had to be to the car rental place at 5 a.m., which means I had to have kids up at 4 a.m. <laughs> mm. Central time. Yeah. Oh, got fun. everybody moving. Got everybody on a plane. We got home Tuesday, and then I got a fever. Oh, man. That, that's what you get for running until you drop, I guess. Overall, fantastic experience. Would I definitely do it again? You bet. I would just hope not to come home and get sick. Oh, for sure. Well, I'm really glad to hear that it was a success. You know, if, if the price you had to pay was a little bit of a sickness, I mean, I don't know how severe it is. Your voice is obviously affected, but right. <laughs> I think it was probably worth it all in all because, I mean, what you did sounds like just an absolute fantastic, exciting experience that I think every technology enthusiast child should get a chance to do, or at least try out for. And the fact you made it as far as you did you know, at Worlds, playing against international competitors, that's just absolutely amazing. And, and I'm willing to bet that long after you and I are gone, those kids will still remember that experience that they had at Worlds and because of everything you put into it. So Super awesome on you. 
I'm so glad they went as far as they did. Just fantastic. It is really cool. And now I've got buttons on my backpack from places all over the world, which is amazing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Not only did I get to have a crazy new experience, you have recently started a new job, Nate. I did. Now, where's not important, but what is important? So I now have an IT management position with a company, a pretty good sized company. Not small, not big, but a good size. It's, it's in a, a factory setting. They hired me not for my Microsoft skills, not for my years of education in the technical field. They hired me to be in IT management because of what they saw me do and present online. They basically combed through cubiclenate.com, which was on my resume. They actually listened to the podcasts I was in, and they saw the different contributions I made to other open source projects, you know, like OpenSUSE and whatnot. So they, they looked at that, they dug into it, they saw like my, uh, let's call it my cyber footprint that I have, which is uh, rather, rather large at this point. And they made, some, uh, made a decision uh, to hire me over, over the other competitors because of, of the, the passion that I have for technology, basically. It was very interesting in the interview process, or actually after the interview was done, and I said, well, now, you know, why did you choose me over, over the many others? And, and one, of the, one of the individuals that made the decision said that it was because I have a home lab and I experiment with things. And, and I, asked, I said, well, I don't experiment with things that are even related to these systems. In fact, I don't have much experience in, and I, and I told them which systems actually there. Please don't kick me off the podcast. Uh, there are a lot of Windows systems there, Windows server systems. And I said, I have almost no, no experience in that. And, and I don't have a lot of you know, VMware experience, although I have other VM experience. And they noted that and they knew that because I had a home lab and I have a passion for technology, they decided that I was a better bet than others. And you know, I'll be honest with you, the first week there, I, uh, I felt like I was in over my head. I felt like that this is a lot, especially the first three days or so that you know, I'm, I'm going to fail here. But after you know, a week and a half now of doing the job, I actually feel really good about it. A lot of these systems, I don't know. And, but really, because I have experimented and played with technology, because I have a passion for technology, they're really all implementation details. There's documentation out there. You can kind of dig into it. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. I really am. Today, I finally got to get through all of the bits of hardware that I'm responsible for, you know, the infrastructural pieces of hardware. I mapped it out you know, in, in reference to the, the rest of the factory. And I'm actually very impressed with the amount of Linux that they have. They actually use some Raspberry Pis that are very critical to specific operations. And I think it's great. It's a lot of fun. And I'm learning a lot about best practices and, and why you know, certain things are done. Like, like for example... Uh, why they use enterprise grade computers and laptops and things to kind of dovetail into another conversation about like, you know, why Linux OEMs are more expensive. Well, actually, they're really in line with business grade machines. And I understand why when you have as large of a deployment of machines as this company has, you can't have cheap machines, you have to have machines that can be repaired. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why they choose machines that they do. They're actually believe it or not, legal reasons why it's necessary to have machines that you can easily take apart. So I'm not going to go any further than that, but it's actually quite an educational experience in that regard too. It's been great. I've enjoyed it so far. It, they're sending me to a technology conference that's not open source, so that's too bad, but a technology conference in Minnesota in the middle of, of May. It's been a lot of fun. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I seem to I seem to fit in there surprisingly, you know, as much of a shut in as I am. They they seem to be welcoming of me. So anyway, yeah, it's going pretty great. Nate, I just got to ask though, have you shared your unhealthy obsession yet? Oh, they knew that coming going into it. Uh, they I'm, they I'm have glad. read his website. Yes. they know. Yeah, they know. <laughs> oh no, no no! I meant with the people that are there that don't know. Um, okay, so he will because I'm pretty. Sh- I'm pretty sure if they don't, within the first week and a half, they do by now. Uh, so I haven't brought in my plushie, my Sousa plushie yet, but uh, <laughs> I, I did make it a point that I'm not sure if I want to stick with these Debian boxes. So we'll we'll see. I'm not going to change anything right now. I'm going to learn what they got. And <laughs> if it's up to me, it's probably not going to stay Debian. I will probably move it to Sousa or Red Hat. Shock. Wait. Well, well it's because Sousa is based on no, it's Red not. Hat. So they they yeah. both use RPMs. So they're different. <laughs> Actually, quite different. Uh, Oh. So, and the reason is, and I, I'm just going to say this from my perspective. So 
as I look for solutions for various things, I don't want any of them to be cubicle Nate solutions or Nate solutions. I want them to be solutions that are sustainable for the company. And what that means is broadening the responsibility of different systems that are implemented. Like right now, if some of these Linux systems, like the, these server services that they have running, if they go down, we have no exterior support. So if I can't be there to fix it, who are they going to call? Oh, wow. So I, I'm going to look at Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. I, I actually I gave them your number, Matt, so they can call you. <laughs> and Wendy, I gave, them, uh, I gave them your number as well. No, actually, I didn't. No, no, no. See, you, you, you gave him Magneto's number because then you know it's broken. Then that will ensure that it's completely broken so we can start from scratch. No, so there, there are some solutions there that are not... Now, they're not like critical systems. Like if they go down, they're not going to shut the factory down. But if they do go down, they will degrade performance of the factory. So there, I do want to look at, at some solutions that, that I can offload some of the responsibility and have support contracts for some of these, some of these solutions because... Nice. That is needed, and and so I, I would actually prefer to have a vendor like, you know, SUSE or Red Hat if they can provide a better solution. I, actually, I will be objective here. As much as I love OpenSUSE and SUSE, and I'm up to my eyeballs in SUSE swag, I actually not quite up to my eyeballs. I, I could use some more SUSE swag. I'll just put it that way. If Red Hat provides a more robust solution for this, then I would actually use them over SUSE. Nothing against SUSE, but I'm just saying I'm going to go for the best solution to do the job not necessarily the solution I want, if that makes any sense. Because it's not about your home lab. It's about this business staying up and running. It's about hundreds of people relying on me to do the right thing. Yeah, exactly. And so the lens you're looking at it through isn't what do I want for my home stuff to play with. It is really focused on making sure the job is getting done in the best and most efficient way possible. Exactly. Yeah, because when it comes to that kind of stuff, it's not about what you prefer, because you have to look at it kind of from the long term too in that, well, I might not be here to manage those systems when I'm, you know, promoted, leave, do whatever. And is that going to leave the company in a lurch because I switched them all to like my niche preferred thing? Right. right. Whatever that may be. I'm not saying SUSE is, but, you know, or you'll, you'll end up like some of these cities who had like free public Wi-Fi, but they fired the guy that was doing the free public Wi-Fi, then they can't get into the network because it's conditioned around that guy's preferences. Mm-hmm. So you're just, it's one of those things where it, it makes total sense to kind of keep that objective outlook on it because being subjective on the, something like that is just, it, that's looking for problems. Right. And, and the reality of the beast is I won't be there forever. I mean, something is right. going to happen to me eventually where I will not work there anymore because... Time goes on. Either I'll retire or they'll move in a different direction or whatever. And, you know, I want to make sure that whoever I have, you know, my direct report, that it's easy for him to take on any of the, the, my tasks as well. You know, so there's always the next generation you got to train. And I just want to make sure that I'm doing the best possible thing for the organization from top to bottom. Mm-hmm. But I'm not changing anything now. I'm not changing a, a single thing until I have complete 100% confidence in every how everything works before I do any transition to anything. So for now, it's going to stay just as it is and we'll improve things as we go. That makes sense. I'm curious as you go through this job, if you will become more and more appreciative of the open source technologies or more understanding of the reason why they choose some of the closed source technologies, maybe a bit of both. We'll have to see as time goes on. Well, I can tell you already, it, it's already a little bit of both. Because I see why they choose what they choose. And I also see why I like open source solutions better. <laughs> it's not lost on me for either thing, but that understanding will become more clear. The, the fog will, will certainly lift. And yeah, and I'll, I'll be very happy to, to talk about, about these things, but I just have to be careful how I, you know, how I do it. Definitely. I understand that. Matt, you have nothing this week. So I guess we'll like it. let's go on to the main topic. This episode of Linux Out Loud is brought to you by Linode. Visit linode.com slash tux and see why over a million developers trust Linode for their infrastructure. From their award-winning support to their ease of use and setup, Linode has been a trusted partner for developers and businesses since 2003 because they offer the industry's best price to performance value for all compute instances, including shared, dedicated, high memory, and GPUs. Linode makes cloud computing simple, affordable, and accessible, allowing you to focus on your customers, not your infrastructure. Visit linode.com slash tux to create a free account, 
Plus, you'll get a 60-day $100 credit to your account. So with Nate's uh, discussion about his new IT management position, it brings up the interesting question about alternative career paths into, well, any career. It doesn't matter if it's creative technology we have this generically predefined condition that this is one way and the only way to a career however we're finding more and more frequently that that is not so much the case like in nate's current situation college is not always the answer for everybody or everything not saying it's not an important aspect you shouldn't go or any of that stuff but for some people and some areas, this is actually a better way and a better alternative to get to where you're looking to go. So some of those different examples are, especially when it comes to technology, is portfolios. Portfolios are really a big thing because it shows a track record of work. So in, like in Nate's case, Nate, you mentioned that the people were looking at everything you did in technology. Yes, they were. That was your portfolio. Es- essentially, all the stuff that you put on was your portfolio. Yeah, It was. And the, the interesting thing about that is I'd started writing about OpenSUSE or technology or whatever, not because I was going for a job or but because I was wanting to be a famous podcaster or the greatest blogger about SUSE of all time, because I'll never be any of those. Wait, I guess I'm a podcaster. I don't think that's, I don't think that's on my resume now that I think about it. The point is, <laughs> gonna have to fix that. Gonna have to fi- you're, you're a content creator, so you're gonna have to fix yeah, something that. like that. I, I sort of, I, I mu- content muddler. Mu- I muddle my way through content. <laughs> anyway, everything just kind of happened because of basically a core passion for OpenSUSE and Linux and open source, which was largely inspired by listening to the Linux Action Show and Linux Unplugged, because they would talk a lot about you know things that they're passionate about, and they would talk about the things I'm passionate about. So I, I said, well, I'm going to start writing about things that I'm passionate about. And it wasn't even like, see what happens from there. It just, I wanted to write about it. And you know, I started putting it on, you know, Google Plus. Remember Google Plus? And I think I did mm-hmm. a little bit of Facebook. And then I got this thing called Twitter. So I was doing that. And then eventually Mastodon added and Google Plus went away. And I'm still sad about Google Plus. I think Google Plus was actually really good. I, I really do. Sorry if, if I'm the only one, but I really enjoyed it. For like technology stuff, it didn't have all the garbage in there. It didn't have the, the crazy weirdos. Well, maybe I was the crazy weirdo. To do your defense, Google Plus Circles was fantastic. Yeah, I liked it. It was great. I, like, you know, I, I watched things like, you know, I, uh, a lot of podcasts like would, would publish things on there like that I, I followed at the time. Mm-hmm. And so it was great. And then I you know, just, you know, cubiclenate.com went from being like one or two views a day to like 24. And now it's, you know, closer to anywhere between like you know, two, two to 500 a day. So it's still not, I mean, it's not a big blog. It's hardly... The numbers are really pretty piddly, really. I mean, in the vast configuration of things. But it's just a place that I go. So when I have to refer back to something, which I do an awful lot, when I need to find something, I, I can very quickly search for it on the site. Or you know, I can use DuckDuckGo or Ami Crawler or Web Crawler or Lycos, whatever whatever search engine you like, right? And <laughs> Alta Vista. <clears throat> Alta Vista, there we go. Use some Alta Vista. I think Ami Crawler was an Amiga one back in the day. But the point is, I can refer back to my notes. And I do it quite a bit. I, I recently used it again for another thing that I, I was trying to, figure out because I couldn't remember. So all this stuff became basically a, a kind of re- resume unintentionally that actually helped me get two different jobs. This is the second job that it helped me get. And I'm, I'm happy for that. And I think that I, I didn't go to school for information technology. I went to school for the industrial trades, which is, you know, it's technology also, just not, it's not IT. It's, it was you know basically engineering, you know, just a little different. If you can demonstrate that you're a good communicator, which I don't know if I, <laughs> I don't know if I'm a good communicator. I can communicate. I don't think I would apply good to that. <laughs> then, you know, people are interested in you. Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't even have to be a personal blog. We've seen people inside of the community who have started to contribute to projects, even starting in their high school years, which is absolutely amazing if you can find projects that you enjoy. And then start learning the process and working with other people and fixing things. And so... You're in that environment of communication, learning how all of that works. And then you can go to employers and show them this is what you've done and that you're willing to learn. And that's kind of what your blog also did is it's showing your employers, 
hey, I may not know this right now, but I'm willing to put in the time and the effort to research how it works, to take the steps and figure it out. Mm -hmm. And in both of those cases, there are quite a few different companies that would love to see, even if you are going to college, would still love to see some of this stuff laid out. Hey, we know this person is willing to put in the time and the effort in making sure that they're learning how to do it, even if they don't know how to do it right now. Right. That's exactly it right there. Yeah. Then you have other ways of showing that within an industry that you can do yourself too. You have things like the online certification process with like comp ITA. And if you're going to go to the, like the, the IT route, like you have the you know, yeah. your networking plus and all that mm -hmm. stuff or your, your Linux plus plus and security plus and all like there are ways to show that you know what you're talking about and or doing based on some of the availability with online accreditations that hold value in that market that you're looking to go into or trade schools as another example that are more sp specific to certain things like electric, like plumbers and electricians and very, very focused. Uh, auto mechanics is another one that has been a lot of people I know have gone down in. Uh, they work for like Harley dealerships and that kind of stuff as well, where they learn about like the you know two stroke, four stroke engines and all the other right. all the other stuff that is really specific to that field. Without I don't want to call it the ancillary stuff. I guess I'll yeah. call it that. Um, that might not really apply directly to what they're doing. It's less book, more hands-on. And there are technical colleges for the IT-related things as yes, well. Mm -hmm. So if that is what your goal is, that's what you want to go into, some of those other programs might be the better avenue. Usually you can end up with an entry-level career in 6 to 24 months, kind of depending on what you're going for. And in a lot of these cases, because the education is so pinpointed on what you want to do, you're not dealing with the additional classes of stuff you have to just get through to get the degree you want. It really is focused on your career. Yeah. And, and also, like with things like auto mechanic or, or you know, if we can work on engines and whatnot, becoming an auto mechanic, I'm willing to bet if a potential employer there sees some sort of passion, maybe Instagram, your your hot rod or your tricked out mm -hmm. garden tractor that shows <laughs> that you have passion for mechanics. I actually know yeah. quite a few mechanics. Um, my husband is one as well. And you've got two different kinds of mechanics. The ones who will work on stuff at work and don't want to work on anything after work, that would be Magneto. <laughs> Even though he has all kinds of projects out here and a lawnmower being one of them. And then you have the other mechanics that they do the day-to-day -day stuff at work and then they do the really fun, creative stuff at home. They, they are basically Tim Allen from Home Improvement. Yes, exactly. The latter. The la the latter. So, like, in my case, I would very much be in that, that first category of, like, where Magneto sits when it comes to tech. I'll work on tech all day if I'm being paid for it. There's a reason I send all my stuff to Ryan when I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, for me, that, that's kind of where I sit with it and understand there's a different passion level. Yes. Like, for me, I don't mind tearing certain things apart and kind of getting down in, into the internals of a piece of tech. Like, as an example, when I re-thermal pasted my PS3. Didn't mind doing that because, you know, I kind of wanted that to last a bit longer. Right. <laughs> right. But on the same note, that's not something I'm going to do with every machine that I get. It's like, okay, whatever. You know, it's like when I wanted to replace that GPU that I had in my old workstation. I sent that to Ryan. I didn't do that. <laughs> Too many pins and everything else. Uh-uh. Too delicate, not not my... Way too many screws and having to take out way too many parts. Exactly. Ryan likes doing that stuff. He enjoys that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. I don't. So, but trade schools and things like having a, as an example, like a YouTube channel where just something that you're passionate about. It doesn't mean, you know, it could be like talking about video games. It could be developing on video games. It could be talking about music or looking at music. Take your pick. There are so many avenues where you can show, like convert a passion or a, a very big interest in an understanding of something to a potential employer mm -hmm. yes. that you have an understanding and knowledge of something without necessarily having gone through the 
same career track that a lot of other people might have gone through. Go spend four to four to eight years in school and et cetera, et cetera. You'll see a lot of that now when it comes to like in music, when it comes to things like DJs and uh, music creation yep. and all those tools and stuff are a lot more, I don't want to say affordable because affordable is relative, mm -hmm. but the ability to make music now, the, the cost of entry has gotten lower due to certain tools and stuff being more, more affordable for people and the hardware being relatively decent price wise and you know kind of the democratization of the the, the field as a whole right i would say that holds true for animation photography filmmaking a lot of these different things by yes they are art creator maker related but you're using technology in order to help you achieve those goals. A lot of the mm -hmm. software in order to do these things, a lot of the hardware is getting to a point where it's easier to afford. And I think my favorite way of learning, especially when it comes to a lot of these art technology correlated fields is finding a mentor. And that's where I got some of my best education on the commercial photography side was working with someone who had been in the field for years, who was very willing to share their knowledge with me, where I could present them with a finished product. We could talk about it. Hey, these are the positives. These are the things that can change. Be able to go back to the drawing board and do it again. Mm -hmm. And if you are able to find a mentor, even in the IT fields, if you're writing code mm -hmm. and you're saying, hey, I would love for someone to check my work. What can I do better? Then finding mentors is an absolute awesome way to learn documenting that information. So when you go to an employer, you can say, hey, I worked with so-and-so. These are the things we did together. And these are the products that came out of it. Yeah. I think it's almost like a, like an accountability, an online accountability partner of sorts that, that helps yeah. you to one, to learn the process, and two, also like, you know, they, they become a reference then too. So if you do go for a job or, or whatever, or you start a business, your own business, you can say, you know, I've worked with so-and-so who is this. It gives, you know, a, a, you know, more legitimacy to what you're able to do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So as an example, um, I've talked about surprise video games. You know, oh. that's my, that's always been my biggest thing, you know, Nate, you know. <laughs> go ahead Nate say I know you got something to say well I know I, I've, I've seen a lot of these uh, these these video games you like and, and the the sort of attire <laughs> that they, they tend to be in <laughs> uh, so like in the video game field a lot of this stuff can apply because the a great way to be able to show companies what you're doing is not necessarily just through like the college degrees and all that stuff. While they're important for certain things, a lot of companies, Obsidian Entertainment is one that comes to mind. They hired a bunch of mod developers that modded New Vegas for their next game. Hmm. So, because the mods are the portfolio. Yeah, they are. What that shows is that you're taking the tools that obsidian made available for fallout new vegas and some of the other games that they've done for the modding community and what you can do with those tools because again it's a track record of showing what you're able to do right for sure so or 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 you have other open source projects that use open source engines like blender and all the other stuff like uh, ubisoft is a big contributor to um, blender now which is one of the the french publishing developing studios that do like assassin's creed and all that stuff mm -hmm. in those games all their work's done in Blender. So if you learn Blender over somebody else that is, you know, on some other 3D modeling program and you apply it to Ubisoft, you already might have a leg up on these guys because you already know the tool better than everybody else. And if you have things that you can show that you developed using that, you have two steps ahead of people now. Right. And that's based solely on the fact that a project is open source, that it's, kind of democratize the the standard in an industry so that anybody can at least come into an industry and present their abilities and kind of let the market decide whether or not they are good enough for what they're looking for. Right. And I think that is a tremendous way that open source as a whole has kind of changed how, not just in technology, but like 
there's so many areas that technology touches that because of that open source style of software development and everything else, it changed everything else from open source to knowledge with things like uh, Khan Academy, um, which is a free 501c that produces mostly supplemental material around like mostly high school and middle school stuff. Mm -hmm. But they do have, they have a financial advice for young business professionals and that kind of stuff. So that is all open knowledge that's available. So the fact if you can bring and access that knowledge ahead of everybody else and have a track record of implementing that knowledge to show that you actually have understood it gets you a long way with employers and a passion definitely does help as well. That robotics conference, that is building up the resumes of these kids. Everything. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's another good another good thing. Involved in community. You got involved in your local community and you are helping these kids build up experience and a and a skill that they can use and will use. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, and they will use it beyond what they just initially have been using it for. That's the thing. Like all the pie brick stuff, all that Python coding that they're learning. Oh yeah. That uh, because Python just kind of whatever you, you throw whatever IDE at you want. Yeah, there's so much flexibility in that code itself. Yeah, so the the stuff that they're learning and the fact that they're learning how it that coding interacts with the physical technology that makes things work is really showing them and helping develop kind of the I hate saying the 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 world of tomorrow, but like the world of tomorrow. But they're the it's. It's bringing that next generation into understanding what makes those things possible Mm -hmm. and shows that interest to what might be possible that they might be able to do in the future. Yep. So let us know your two cents and throw a comment down in the video comments below, or you can email us or just, you know, yell at us on our preferred social media. Or just yell at Matt. (laughs) I'm good with that. Yeah, you can yell at Matt. I'm used to it, so it's fine. <laughs> Though in fairness, I might yell back. <laughs> no. Hello, Magneto here. This episode of Linux Out Loud is sponsored by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the password manager that we, well, that they use and trust. Bitwarden lets you set up things like a pin to easily access your password, as well as additional authentication such as master password and adding phrases to fingerprint security all to keep your password safe. From me, Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and businesses to store, share, and sync their sensitive data. Go to bitwarden.com tux to get started for free. $10 premium account includes one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, or Duo, Vault Health Reports, and TOTP Authenticator Storage and Generation, and Priority Customer Support. Make the smart move, like many from the community have, and go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started for free. If you're like my wife, Sinister Wendy, you'll want to show your appreciation by signing up for the Premium Edition, especially since the Premium Edition only starts at $10 a year. Thanks to Bitwarden for supporting this episode of Lennox Out Loud. Magneto out. So, Wendy, speaking of Python and various things related to robotics, uh, you're still doing Pybrick stuff, apparently? Yes, absolutely. We brought Pybricks with us to Worlds, and I want to be totally open about the fact that we were, not only were we using beta firmware, it was available on their GitHub, but it was in a side thread. It wasn't actually released on the public beta side of things. And so the problems we ran into, we as a team knew walking in that we were using beta firmware. And now it has been released publicly, not just on the side chat. And I can't wait to actually play with the current release that's been put out. There's some really, really cool things that they are doing with that on the Pyrex side. So in our experience, one of the things that we were running into, and I kind of suspected that it was an issue towards the end of our coding of stuff, but... 
it was really at a place that we could no longer really fix it. So our robot, when you turn it on and you do the first full run through of programs, was running into issues. And then you'd go to run it again and it was fine. Like there was literally nothing to fix in the code. And so I don't know somewhere in the firmware where that first run through, there were some errors potentially piling up on each other, causing it to not do exactly what we coded to do. And then on the next run through, those errors didn't pile up that time. And so it ran the run completely. We were wanting to test this theory out. And so on their third official run, one of our team members had held the robot and ran it through all of the different missions and then put it back in the box so that it would be on and ready to go when we got to our table. Unfortunately, it turned itself off before we got to our table, so we weren't able to test that theory on the game floor. But overall, considering that the kids completely wrote their code between our head-to-head and going to Worlds, and it was using beta firmware that was just being tested out for Vibrix. I think it did awesome. I'm excited to take it with us to regionals next year as an official release. One of the awesome people from Vibrix had sent me a message over Mastodon asking if I was interested in having a gyro drive place class instead of adding positive direction and use gyro parameters. I will link this thread in the show notes so you can actually read it out. That's cool. Yes. And my response is absolutely. While adding those terms to your drive base. So essentially what you're doing with Pybrix is when you're setting up your drive motors, you're choosing You're telling it which one is the left motor, which one is the right motor, what your wheel circumference is, how far apart those wheels are. And with the pre-public beta that we were using, you were adding what the positive direction was, which at that point it was only counterclockwise. This is all for gyro related. At the point that we were using it, it had to be counterclockwise and then telling it to use the gyro and that worked. We were able to take the existing code that they had, plug those in and make all of that stuff work. In this case, instead of calling on your regular drive base, which you still get to use all of the same things, you have a separate drive base that is just using your gyro functions. Even though we had issues with potentially some of those errors piling up in the beginning of it, was crucial to our robot being able to use Pybrix. And I know going into next year, we're going to be able to talk about some different design choices of our robot. So our wheels were set pretty far back. There was a whole lot of weight up front. And just using the standard turns we weren't achieving the right angles just because there was so much weight up front. Then adding that gyro onto it made a huge difference. And so robot design is going to come into play with that, not only with turns, but how well they're able to achieve missions with attachment points that can do multiple things at one time. But I love this idea of you being able to use the drive base in two different ways. Hey, for these commands... I don't want it to use the gyro, but over here with these other ones, I definitely do. And they are giving us so many different options. While we weren't the highest scoring team, I can definitely say I'm glad we had Pyrex at Worlds with us, and I can't wait to see what the kids do with it next game season. That's super cool that you got to interact with the folks from Pyrex and get some feedback, and, and hopefully uh, that, that actually motivates the kids even more to do more with Pybrix because, you know, hey, I know somebody, you know, one of those things. So, yeah, it's really awesome. <laughs> it's been a fun adventure, and 
I love being able to provide feedback to them on how it works on an FLL table because it is different between just playing with it at home and then teams being able to use that in a game environment. And some of the things that sometimes work well for just playing at home don't necessarily translate well into using them as a team. Or there's other things that you find where, hey, this little inconsistency might be fine at home, but it makes it hard to make it work for an FLL team. And just being able to provide that feedback. And they're always so open to the feedback that we have for them. And I love hearing what they're thinking. Hey, this is something that we're thinking about doing what do you think as a mentor of an FLL team? Amazing crew, amazing project. I, once again, just can't speak highly of them enough. That's great. It really is. Python code and PyBriggs are something I'm going to continue playing with throughout the summer. I know from what I've heard, you guys talked all about gaming last week, and you got a little taste of that for us again this week with Game of the Week. Take us into it, Matt. So this particular game this week is one called Ultra Age. It is, the best way to describe it is it is a mix of Devil May Cry, which is a action combat game, a third person action combat game. And I honestly really don't know what other game to mix it with. <laughs> but it's about it's about combat. It really, generically, that's kind of its, its sole focus. Theory is a story, but it... it it don't matter. This game is simply about gameplay. That's all that matters. So it's, it's a hack and slash third person action game. It's about stringing together different combos in combat that allow you to have a higher score, get better gear and that kind of stuff. Uh, it, really short game, probably six or seven hours. Not a whole lot of replay value mm. if you're looking for like a new game plus or that kind of stuff. The price can be a little high for that amount of content it's usually not a game style that i would recommend personally because i don't like you know for every hour i for every dollar i expect an hour basically is how my generic spending process goes because this game runs about 25 dollars normally on steam however if you go to i believe it was either fanatical or indie gala they had it on sale for like 12 bucks so it was a little more in line with kind of my expectations and that kind of stuff. And I had looked at it before. It's available on the Switch as well um, and PS4. It is rated teen, so it does have the kind of an anime vibe to the character design, that kind of stuff, as far as like the main character. But there's really, it's combat, combat, and more combat. That's <laughs> really the game. Well, I personally like the um, the giant snake with the head that looks like the front of a of a fighter plane. That's pretty cool. <laughs> the art style is neat the the boss battles are quite creative as far as like the character design uh-huh. for the bosses and stuff uh there there's like a timber wolf with like angel wings hmm. is on one of them uh so it's a it's a fun game for what it is if you're expecting like a deep story let's be real most of you aren't gonna play these type of games for the story you don't play bayonetta or you don't play devil may cry or whatever for the story you play it for the combat it's the gameplay silly that's what it's basically for yeah it that's what this game is it it's all gameplay it looks like a high energy game you just how we get in you play it's kind of a almost arcadey feeling a little bit i think but you said only about four mm-hmm. hours of gameplay huh no, nah, it took me about six or seven okay. to actually beat the game. At the at the twenty five dollars that they're asking for on Steam, I would be a little hesitant. If you go to like Fanatical or Indie Gala, which are the two sites that I usually go to for like deals and stuff, you can find it for like twelve bucks. So it's a little more palpable at that kind of price range. Yeah, I'm surprised you're recommending it. <laughs> Where's the comment? Come on. The girls are wearing clothes. It's really <laughs> strange for you to recommend a game like that, <laughs> Matt. Uh, Nate, I'll have you. Rec- uh, I will highly say that the games that I've recommended over the last few weeks have nothing remotely like that. Thanks. I know, but there's still the no momentum behind it. <laughs> <laughs> I could do an entire year, so 52 episodes of games that are nothing like that that I've actually played, and I will still get labeled with that tag. Yes. <laughs> yep. Because <laughs> just. 
Whatever. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> yeah, you should. Nate, just like you should give up saying you don't have an unhealthy obsession with Open Sousa. I have an almost unhealthy obsession with Open Sousa. Almost. You're right. It is unhealthy. Thank you for agreeing. I, I use it every day on multiple machines and I smile the entire time. Except once. And we have plushies. You have plushies. Like, well, actually, I re- Need I say more? I have one plushie and then like a, a cable like a, a, a cable thing. So while I'm making game recommendations that apparently fall outside the norm, <laughs> Nate, you're doing something that definitely falls outside the norm for you, interacting with people. Yes. Like physically. So I talked about this last week. I'll talk about it again this week. I'm going to be at Southeast Linux Fest, or also called Self, at, uh, at the Sheridan Charlotte Airport in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm going to have a booth there. I'll, I'm going to do Linux Saloon from there on Saturday night. Probably just off in the corner. It won't be like a announced by anybody at self, I'm sure. But anyway, so I'm excited to be there. I'm excited to meet some people that are in the Linux and open source tech world again. I went there last year, had a great time, and look forward to going there this year. That's it. <laughs> now it's your turn to toss in your two cents on today's topic. Hit the discourse forum, drop us a line under this video or on the contact form by visiting tuxdigital.com slash contact. Contact's what you put in your eye. Uh, or on your eye, I suppose. If you'd like to hang out with us on our preferred social media, see the link at the bottom of the show description. Find other great shows like Hardware Addicts, Game Sphere, Linux Saloon, and more at tuxdigital.com. Show off your love for your favorite podcasts and shows by visiting the Tux Digital merch store. Go grab yourself some awesome swag like the gamer centric I pause my game to be here shirt. Or join hashtag Team Wendy for some sinister Wendy swag. She really is that sinister. So sinister, her voice is worn out. Hey, be nice to me. I don't feel good. <laughs> <laughs> As always, we thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week for another awesome episode of Linux Out Loud. Until then, keep the banner friendly of the conversation somewhat on topic and have fun doing it. Yeah.